Michael Anderson is a union lawyer specializing in First Amendment defense. He is described as delivering funny, intense political monologues, and that after he takes off his tie, he talks to audiences in a way they don't allow in federal court. <laughs> He has performed in venues from across the country in San Francisco over here to Boston and has starred in Freestyle Shakespeare at Jimmy Tingle's Off-Broadway Theater. And he thinks there's no such thing as free speech if you don't use it. And I'll end with a quote uh, that I have for Michael uh, about him and his work as a story liberator uh, rather than storyteller. Put George Orwell essays, Road Runner cartoons, and the first two Clash albums into a blender, and you've got Michael Anderson. Please give him a hand. A myth is not something that happened once. Something only gets to be a myth if it happens over and over and over. I'll give you an example. The Greeks tell a story about this guy Orpheus, a sensitive guy, an intellectual guy, and you'd think that a guy like that would do pretty well with women, but no! You see, like, the first time he actually manages to get a girlfriend, just 10 seconds into the relationship, she trips over a volcano and falls into hell. Because the good ones are never mentally stable. And he figures he's gonna be the hero and he goes down after her and he confronts the devil and he says, I want my girlfriend back. And the devil says, well, that's gotta be the most selfish thing I've ever heard. I mean, this is really just all about you, isn't it? I mean, how do we know that you're doing this for her? And he says, no, you don't understand. I love her. So the devil says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I will let you lead her out of hell, provided that you never once get insecure and turn around to check that she's behind you. So they walk, 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 all the way back up out of hell, and they're breaking out into the sunlight, and he feels such joy, such liberation, that he wants to share the moment, and he turns around, and she looks at him and says, Oh, God, no! You're just another selfish jerk like all the others! Wah! And she falls all the way back into hell. And this, my friends, is a myth because it happens over and over and over. Okay, the year is 1987, and I am at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, okay? And I'm standing in line at the food court to get an oyster po' boy, when suddenly I realize that standing immediately behind me in line is Miss Karen Allen. You know, the, the movie actress. You know, that, I, that feisty little brunette from Raiders of the Lost Ark? You know, like, I always knew you'd come walking back through my door, Indiana Jones. Oh, 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 and that scene, that scene where she's in the satin nightgown and she jumps into that unusual Nazi plane and starts blowing up all the gas trucks? Oh, be still, be still, my beating heart. Karen Allen, her, her and Ellen Barkin were my top two fantasy figures during my teenage years. And she is standing right behind me. And okay, it's her. It's not some woman that looks like her. This is her. And she's not there with a publicist or an agent or any visible boyfriend. And I'm thinking, okay, well, when do I talk to her? Do I wait until we hit the counter and I say, I'll have an oyster po' boy and whatever Miss Karen Allen is having? No, no, that's creepy. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be brave. I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna turn around and show her how much I care about her work in independent films. So I turn around 
and her eyes light up like I'm the first person at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival that has recognized her. And, and she actually speaks to me first. I'll never forget what she said. She said, hi. <laughs> And, okay, okay, I want to show her that I'm, I'm not just some creepy stalker, you know, that, that I really do understand her work in independent filmography. So I, so I look bashfully down at my shoes, because that always works. And, and, and she, says, she, she says, yes? And, and I say, you know, I really liked Diner. <laughs> and her eyes freeze. And she gets that angry, rich English woman look in her jaw. And she says, I wasn't in Dinah. <laughs> and it's only then that I realized, no, it was Ellen Barkin who was in Diner. Ah! Oh, God! And in the first 10 seconds of our relationship, I've just revealed that I've been cheating on her in my fantasy life. Oh, oh, and she, she turns away and walks out of line back into her own private hell. And this, my friends, is a myth because it happens over and over and over. Okay. The year is 1996. And this guy on my soccer team comes up to me with a videotape and he says, you gotta watch this, man. This is gonna kick your and I, I take the tape, and it's the 1996 African Nations Cup final that he's just taped off some pirate satellite. And this year, the finals are South Africa versus Tunisia. And everyone's been waiting for this because this is the first time since the fall of apartheid that a South African national team has been allowed to play in the light of day. And for a fanatic like me, this is a strange and delicious treat. Because, okay, you see, soccer is a kind of propaganda <laughs> that every nation shows off its personality, its way of thinking in the tactics of its national team. That, that it's only natural that the Brazilians are rhythmic and fluid and that the Germans are disciplined and aggressive and the Italians are manic and defensive and the English are not what they used to be. And the Americans, well, our men are second rate. It is our women who are the best in the world. So, Everyone wants to know, all right, South Africa, for the first time, what does freedom look like? How does the rainbow nation play? And I put the tape in, and the answer is, like a bunch of mental patients. <laughs> See, they have no apparent organization, that they never had any foreign coaches, that rugby was always the money sport of apartheid, and soccer was just something for the blacks to play on dirty fields in front of drunken crowds. And in the shanty towns, they don't really come to see organization. They come for entertainment. And they have two heroes. There's Mark Fish. He's tall, he's fast, he's crazy as a loon. And okay, get this, he's white. He's one of three white guys on the team. And the way he deals with being a racial minority is he makes himself the biggest showboat on the field. He's like a, a Harlem Globetrotter in reverse. And when he does something to please his black patrons, they pull out the halibut and the salmon that they have smuggled into the stadium, and they all sing, fish, fish. <laughs> But Fish is only the lieutenant to the captain, Johnny Shoes Moshweu. The program says he's 39. Yeah, okay, the way that Zsa Zsa Gabor was 39. 
and nobody knows how old this guy really is, except that he used herbs and black magic to keep his body young enough to outlive apartheid. So finally, at the age of 45 or 50, he's finally playing for his country. Except it's not really playing. You see, I mean, he doesn't, he's not as fast as he used to be back when he was 40, you know, I mean, he, he, he can't get, he can't blow by defense, defenses the way he did in the 19th century. He, he, he has to get by with the treachery of old age. So what he does is he wanders around the field, clucking like a chicken, looking for a lost contact lens, jumping jacks over on the side of the field, until eventually the opposition figures out that they, they don't really have to pay attention to this guy. He's useless. He's harmless. He's invisible. And only then, when he has completely dropped off their radar screen, like a Romulan death ship. Shoes Moshweu uncloaks. Oh, oh, and I'm watching this game and it is the weirdest game of soccer I have ever seen in my life. Because the Tunisians are probing for all the weaknesses in the South African formation. But the problem is, they don't really have a formation. <laughs> They're just swooping in at the ball like seagulls on a loaf of bread. And it's like watching Gary Kasparov playing Grandmaster Chess against Curly from the Stooges. Oh, oh, and, you know, we are deep into the game and there's still no score. And finally, a Tunisian shot cracks against the crossbar. And the ball skips up in the air and lands down at the feet of Mark Fish. And what you're supposed to do here when you're a defender and you have the ball and you're just three yards in front of your own goal is you are supposed to kick the ball out of bounds immediately. But Fish has an opportunity to have fun. And suddenly it's showtime at the Apollo and Fish starts to bounce the ball off his foot playing keepy-uppies right in front of his goal, taunting his Tunisian marker, who is a proud Muslim who will not be mocked. So he breaks in on the ball and at the last second Fish just dinks it three yards out of the way and jumps straight up in the air. So Fish and Ball go perpendicular away from each other as the Tunisian comes thundering in underneath him. And Fish comes down straddling the guy's head and says, whoop, no ball here, and rolls three yards to his right to collect the ball like a child from daycare. And all over the stadium out come the halibut and the trout as they sing, ah, fish, fish, and his fish breaks up into the midfield, the Tunisian captain, Bukadida, comes to deflect his run. And he's playing perfect open field defense, forcing Fish to run sideways rather than forward. And this is very good defense against a mentally healthy opponent. <laughs> But Fish is perfectly happy to run in any direction on the compass. So they go racing, picking up speed as they go toward the sideline until just two feet away from the out of bounds, Fish sticks out his foot and stops the ball cold. Bing! And like the coyote on Acme roller skates, Bucadita goes rocketing past him. Oh, and the crowd's on its feet. Oh, fish, fish, as fish goes charging into the, into, the, uh, into the Tunisian side of the field. And you see, this is the problem, my friends, with being an anarchist, is that you always find yourself on the attack without the slightest idea what you are doing. <laughs> And Kumalo and Masinga are running alongside him, begging for a pass, but no, no, the, 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 the sound of the crowd is echoing in Fish's brain, and he charges on alone, half a league onward. And the Tunisian defense is not amused. <laughs> they form up across his path, 
like riot police, and Fish starts trying to stagger his way through them like an alcoholic at an intervention, and they start to shepherd him across deep into the far corner like wolves driving a sheep, the far corner, that lonely place where solo performance art goes to die. <laughs> And with four Tunisians surrounding him right by the corner flag, Fish turns and in an act of suicidal bravado just whacks the ball blind across the field. And on the video, you can see the Tunisians just rolling their eyes because, I mean, that is so high school. You know, like when you run into trouble, you just like pump the ball away off aimlessly off into nothingness. when out of nothingness. <laughs> Shoes moshweu, uncloaks. Oh, just 10 yards off the far post of the goal he appears. And on the video, you can see the Tunisian's look of scorn turn to horror as shoes appears like Banquo's ghost behind them. And one by one, they go up in the air like pistons, like punk rockers trying to get ahead on the ball. But no, it's coming in too high and shoes will not jump up in the air like a fool. He turns his back on the ball like a jilted lover and looks up into the air like the adoration of the saints. And as his legs start to climb Jacob's ladder into the air, I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You only hear about this in legend. The, the moment when Pele ascended into heaven, the overhead volley, the upside down bicycle kick. And I feel kind of sorry for the Tunisian goalkeeper because you know I'm a goalkeeper myself. And when I see a line drive coming in high across my area, I am ready for a lot of things. I am ready for the ball to skip out to the wing and someone's going to get in behind. I am ready for someone to head the ball back down into traffic. But the one thing I am not ready for is some 65-year-old witch doctor climbing up 10 feet in the air and hanging like a bat upside down to take a one-touch volley into the top corner. No, I am not ready for that. And as the ball goes whizzing past him, the Tunisian goalkeepers just stand in there like a man waiting for the bus. And as the net billows out from the ball, the crowd goes deathly quiet. And it takes me like five seconds of silence to figure out that the speakers on my TV have shorted out <laughs> from the sound of an entire country exploding. Oh, and, and on the screen, Kumalo and Masinga and Fish come to bury Moshweu in the, in, you know, with their bodies on the field. And the, 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 the image is getting all blurry. I'm thinking, you know, it's just, it's just the, 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 the picture tube on my TV is broken down. And then I realize, no, no, no. The TV cameras in the stadium are shaking <laughs> from the seismic force of 60,000 people jumping on top of each other. And all over the stadium, they're peeling off their boots and their sneakers and holding them up. Ah, shoes, shoes. <laughs> and they throw them up in the air and there's this popcorn cloud of halibut and trout and sneakers and high tops raining down all over the stadium. And the camera, the camera zooms in on the president's box where there's all these stiff dignitaries who are trying to look pleased, but they're obviously a little freaked out to be standing in the middle of a full-scale riot in Johannesburg. And only Mandela is out of his seat. I, I've never seen a head of state lose it like this in public as his security guards are trying to protect him from the hailstorm of like mackerel and Nikes like hitting him in the head, but it's like a shower for him. And, and he's up there, He's up there, he's like a little boy. I mean, I've never seen, he's, he's letting it go like a Mexican radio announcer. <laughs> oh! Oh! Goal, 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 goal. 
And I wonder if in all his years in prison, if even Nelson Mandela could have imagined such a Monty Python moment of redemption <laughs> as the miracle of the fish and the shoes. Wow. So I'm playing tennis in the rain, wondering what gift I'm getting. I mean, today's my father's 85th birthday. And I remember the day he taught me to ride a bike. Angle your right pedal, he said, as he calculated the amount of force necessary to overcome the bicycle's inertia. <clears throat> P equals one half mass dot radius squared. It's inertia. It's kind of laziness inertia is, the unwillingness of objects to change. He should know. He's a theoretical physicist. And I'm six years old. <laughs> to achieve a rolling velocity of six, mile, six meters per second, you need an angle of 10, no, 9 degrees, and a force of 5.76 newtons <coughs> or kilogram meters per second squared. <laughs> My bike is green with big tires. <laughs> 36 years later, he buys a, a blue bike with a wide seat, and, and we're staring at it, and he turns to me and he says, how do you ride this thing? <laughs> and I realize, he's never ridden a bike before. <laughs> the alley is narrow, concrete with speckled stones. I try to remember everything he taught me about mass dot radius and that lazy thing about Newton. Angle your right pedal, I say, as he pushes off, his hands curved over the curl of his handlebars, his feet pumping like the wings of the boy who flew too close to the sun, and his tires wobbling like the earth does as it travels around on its axis every 23,000 years. And I'm playing tennis in the rain and what would have been my father's 85th birthday. Aristotle said, in the absence of forces, all objects come to a state of rest. And I'm remembering just how still a body at rest can be, how a face and legs can remain cold like the north wind, and a little finger can remain bent just so. I hit the ball. My tennis racket overcoming inertia with a force of maybe 5.76 newtons, like all objects wanting to resist change, but realizing everything is a gift. Thank you. Make yourself a perfect egg. Mark well what I do tell. First choose one from a free range hen, her yolk so firm and yellow. <coughs> breathe in, breathe out then, crack the shell right smartly without quaking. And you will have a perfect egg to fry with ham or bacon. Now women, for a perfect life, mark well what I do tell o. Tis best in matters of romance to choose a free-range fellow. The kind that sets your soul ablaze for whom your body's yearning. And then the both of you must stoke the fires and keep them burning. I'll not forsake My yokes they sometimes break And blissful dreamers Often wake to grieving They say that heaven's nice But earth it must suffice Until it finally comes Our time for leaving Meanwhile I've learned That broken yokes Make omelets worth eating 
and kindness leads to lasting love while passion may be fleeting. Perfection is a lofty goal that some of us will strive for. Yet scrambled yokes and scrambled dreams bring much to stay alive for. Yes, scrambled yokes and scrambled dreams bring much to stay alive for. Thank you. Sons and daughters, daughters and sons, the bundles from heaven, the wonderful ones, the terrible twos and the sensitive threes, then quick as a whisper, the birds and the bees. Slowly growing, leaving the nest, flying from love that was always the best, drawn away by a world so fragile and false, and a chance for a dance in the wanderer's waltz. La da da, la da da, la da 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 da. And a chance for a dance in the wanderer's waltz. Watched him twirling and hold back the tear, and pray for an angel to lead them from here <coughs> to the land of tomorrow with sugars and salts, and dancers learning the wanderer's waltz. You can teach all you've learned, but they'll learn what they will. You can give all you have, but they'll need more to fill. You can't lock your treasures in windowless vaults. You can't keep them home from the wanderer's walls. La da da, la da da, la da 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 da. You can't keep them home from the wanderer's walls. May they find what they're after through the wind and the rain. May the joy and the laughter diminish the pain. May they spin to the truth through the shallow and false. May they come safely home from the wanderer's walls. Who knows where it goes? Who knows when it halts? Who knows the right words for the wanderer's waltz? Thank you. Yeah. 